My name is Sridhala Swami. I'm from India and uh, I write poetry and fiction for very young children. Uh, the best thing about being a writer in India is that it's probably easy to survive um, while doing what I do, which is freelance, which is a good way of saying I don't do very much, but it's easy to survive as a, as a writer, as a journalist, and it's easy to be many things at once. And uh, the best thing about being a writer is there's no shortage of stories around you. There, there's no shortage of inspiration of, um, of things happening around you, either socially or politically or personally, or you step out of your door and there are stories. Um, the worst? I don't think there's a worst. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that that has anything to do with location because the worst thing about being a writer is probably, uh, you know, just being stuck for inspiration at any given point. And that could happen anywhere. The best thing about my country, that is such a loaded question because I think, you know, when, when, when you ask that question, the temptation to answer it with exotica or, you know, with, uh, with kind of being a native informant for your country is very high. And I don't want to do that, so I, I really don't know what the best thing about my country is. <laughs> I ask myself this question every day and we, I was asked this question by a student at NOCA um, when we were in New Orleans and um, you know the facetious answer to that is to bat it off by saying um, I ask myself that every day and then not give an answer to it. But uh, one of our other writers um, and said and I think I agree is that you know you, you write when you write, you, you open out this path that, that no one else has been able to see or has trod upon. And you, you write because by writing, you open out this, this little window into your life or into your perspective on the world, which is as important as anybody else's. Uh, this is something that I tell my son sometimes. Uh, he's always ready to see the other person person's point of view and, and I tell him you have to let other people know your point of view because you're the only person who's occupying your space in the world and uh, that's, that's probably why I write. Um, this writer that I discovered for the first time while writing a review of his book, I knew him as a poet. His name is Sundara Ramaswamy. I knew him in a completely different context. I knew him through his poetry, and I knew him because of a filmmaker friend of mine who had uh, gone to film him, and he had, uh, you know, he had this entire camera full of uh, film which was the last interview this writer gave before he died. And this filmmaker was returning from these interviews and the tsunami hit while he was in transit. And his camera got taken away and he lost this entire series of interviews with this writer, including the last interview with him. These were the things I knew about him before I read um, his other work. So there's, there's this really large a novel that he wrote called Children, Women, Men. And uh, it, it spans pre-independence, um, Kerala, the old Travancore state, although the writer Sundara Ramaswamy wrote in Tamil. Uh, it's about Kerala at a particular point of transition from a pre-modern India to a post-independence. Um, society that was in great flux. So it's about a number of families and, and the, the milieu of that place and how it transits from that into a modern India. But what is most interesting for me in his writing is this book that I have right here. It's called JJ Some Jottings. And it's this, 
it's a completely made up biography of one of the characters in that novel. He's a poet and he's a writer and he's, he makes these transitions between different kinds of writing over his lifetime. But what Sundara Ramaswamy does is he fictionalizes this entire thing and while doing it, he kind of critiques the entire Tamil literary establishment. So you have these characters who are, uh, you know, progressive writers, revolutionary, or people who are associated with little magazines, or people who are theorist, communist writers. And then you have uh, this person who's writing in this very postmodern vein. And it's an amazing novel because you, you, you kind of, you're always looking for, it's, it's like a Roman Oclef. You're trying to identify people that you think might be real, but at the same time, it's such an amazing piece of writing. Everything makes you want to reread it and copy down bits that are really great. And has it been translated? It has been translated. I'm reading it in translation because I can't read in Tamil. <laughs> I mean, when I, when I was growing up, I think the default thing that you do is to read fiction because you're used to reading stories. You, that's how you begin and that's how you continue. At some point, I started watching films and my poetry drew from my film viewing rather than... So I think um, I started reading poetry for the love of reading poetry very much later in my life. So my, my writing has always drawn from fiction, from... Um, and from cinema rather than poetry to begin with. <laughs> Today, if you ask me, yeah. it will be a yeah. different answer. Yeah. Today, I want to say, I mean, I'm just drawing a film out of the air. It's not like it's my favorite, yeah. but today I'm thinking of Ashik Karib, uh, uh, Parajanov, the Georgian filmmaker Parajanov. I'm thinking of Ashik Karib. Yeah. I think it was the writer writer China Mieville who said recently that, you know, I mean, our, uh, our publishing lives are very unequal. There are people who write and make a lot of money out of it. And there are people who really struggle to put their work out there. And things would, I think it would be so much better if, if there was a more evenly distributed state support so that it would be possible for a lot of writers to write. And it's not that we don't have it. In India, we do have a lot of state support in terms of uh, avenues where we could get published. You know, you have the Sahitya Academy at both the local level and at the state level. And um, they support publishing. They're not great at distributing the work that they publish. But they, uh, I mean, there are so many writers. There are Sunil Gangopadhyay, Jayant Mahapatra, all of these writers whose work would never have been published at all if it hadn't been for the support of the state. Uh, what would help is, you know, more evenly distributed bursaries that writers can apply for in order to support themselves and free their time up to write really complex pieces of work. I think the private sector or not-for-profit organizations do that now. They do it a little better. You have the India Foundation for the Arts. You could apply for uh, research grants or bursaries in order to support your some specific project. A lot of this work, um, this writer that I was talking about, Sundara Ramaswamy, he, uh, he had the entire work of the Tamil writer Pudumai Pittan translated, mm. um, uh, first collected and then translated. I mean, he produced the definitive edition of his work. And that wouldn't have happened without the support of a not-for-profit not organization. So I think, yeah, whether it comes from the state or elsewhere, yes, I think writers do need the support of some outside organization. It, in its modern avatar, it would be the patronage that mm -hmm. other people provided once upon a time. It's my first visit. And what surprised me is just very ordinary things, which is that everywhere I, I go, I feel comfortable weather-wise. I mean, I feel like I'm back home. I don't know how to say this. I feel like, you know, when I was in Scotland a couple of years ago, I didn't feel at home in that sense. I felt everything, you know, the trees were new, the weather was new, the light was new. It stayed light till way into the night. And all of those things were strange to me. Over here I came in and it was so hot. 
it was like Hyderabad. I felt like I was at home. I went to New Orleans. I felt like I was at home. The trees were familiar. The taste of the food was familiar. The humidity was familiar. The architecture was familiar. So um, that that is what surprised me. It, it surprises me that all of this should feel so familiar. You know, it depends on who's asking the question. Um, I was thinking about this for some time because I, I, I don't know. I'm the one who's usually doing the questions. I would like anyone who's asking questions of me to have maybe found out where else I've answered questions and, you know, you know and not ask those <laughs> questions just so that I don't get bored, <laughs> just so that I have something interesting to answer. But on the other hand, you know, if it was, say, the other writers at the IWP, I would want them to ask me more about the writing in my country. I would, I would want people to ask me more so that I just have the cue I need to answer. <laughs> No, uh, not particularly. I mean, I, the only thought that I've been kind of working my way through in my one month, five weeks over here is, um, you know, it's related to what question would others ask of me, which is, what would I ask of other people while I've been here? And uh, sometimes I feel that I don't sufficiently ask enough questions of other people. I think one of the writers from the residency uh, in, in a previous year, Mani Rao, I spoke to her before coming over here. And she said, you know, what will happen is that people will start talking with each other about their personal lives. And the conversations will move away from writing into personal zones. And I think while that is important as human beings to connect with each other on the personal level, I think it's important to kind of keep, uh, keep the conversation going about our writing and about exchanging news of our parts of the world in our writing lives. And I think as writers, we are attempting to do that by our salons and by our little individual discussions. But I still feel, um, that I am not moving out of my comfort zone in the sense that once you find the people who are easy to talk to or with whom you have share a lot, it's easy to continue your conversations over there. I want somehow to be able to step out and talk to the people that I know nothing about, that I find hard to talk to and find a way to not connect even, but just begin a conversation. Yeah, I don't mind if I don't connect, but I still want to be able to begin a conversation. Out of my comfort zone. Four more weeks. Out of my comfort yeah. zone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Natasha. Thanks.